Hello everyone, I'm John Mark Cox. And I'm Beverly Ross, and we are grateful you are watching. If you are local or close to Clarksville, we want to personally invite you to join us in person for worship. We hear from our guests often that they watch online, so if that's you, let this be a personal invitation to join us here at church. If you're an individual, large family, or military, we have something for everyone. That's right. We have something for everyone. We have connect groups from preschool all the way through adults. Our connect hour starts at 9 a.m. and our worship service starts at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. We would love to see you here in person with us. If you're not local and you're watching online, we'd love to hear from you as well. Where are you watching from? Can we pray for you? Email us, type it in the chat. We'd love to be able to minister and respond to you. And our mission here is to worship God, love people, share Jesus, and make disciples. We want nothing more as a church staff than to serve His church. We also want to extend to you the opportunity to partner with us in sharing the gospel through giving. You can give online right now by scanning this QR code or tap the link fbct.org slash give in your web browser at any time. Well, today we continue in our sermon series, I Am, with a focus on I Am the Light of the World. But first, let's turn our hearts and minds to Jesus and sing together.
we begin our Palm Sunday service with a beautiful picture of Bible baptism. In the baptistry this morning, we have Julie Wiggins. Julie is one of our custodial helpers, and she's being baptized, and you will meet her mom and dad for they're being baptized as well. They are all born in the Philippines and have come to our country and came to our city about two years ago. We are thrilled to welcome them to our community. Julie, I have a question for you. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and have you invited him into your heart and life? Yes. Upon your profession of faith, in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister Julie, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Rose, thank you for making the effort to getting in the baptistry today. I have a question for you. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and have you invited him into your heart and life? Yes. Amen. Amen. Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, Rose Bakhtak, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Vic, I have a question for you. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And have you invited him into your heart and life? He nods yes. Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, in obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother Vic, Bet Bapta, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Hold your nose. Now, I have the privilege of praying for all three. Father in heaven, thank you for Vic, for Rose, and for Julie. Thank you for the opportunity that they have had to hear the gospel and respond in a way that honors you. Thank you for the opportunity that we've had to baptize them by immersion today. We welcome you to this time, Lord, and we worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless our service today that we would sing praises to your name, give glory and honor to your presence, and then respond positively to the message this morning from Pastor Ronnie on I Am the Light. Thank you for hearing our prayer today. In Jesus' powerful name we pray, amen. What a great way to begin worship today and uh, baptism and by singing that song. It's great to welcome you to Palm Sunday today as we celebrate Jesus coming into Jerusalem and ultimately going to give his life for you and for me and die for us and pay our sin debt in full. And we get to celebrate that today as we look forward to Friday with Good Friday. We hope you'll be in our service here in the Grace Worship Center on Friday at noon, and then as we come together next Sunday morning for our connect groups, and then as we come to celebrate the resurrection of Christ next Sunday morning in this space at 10.30, but we welcome you today. Weren't you blessed by the baptism just a few moments ago? Incredible. And uh, I had the joy of of, uh, sitting over there and just being blessed by seeing a daughter and her mom and dad obey the Lord in baptism. It was a joy because I sat with Julie the afternoon she was born again and she put her faith and trust in Christ and then had the opportunity of meeting with her mom and dad and her as well. It was very touching to me to see Julie take her dad's hand. And there's something powerful about worshiping together 
And so to our guests and to all of our members, we want to say thank you for being here today. If you are a guest with us and you've never filled out a Connect card, we would love for you to do that. One of our guest cards, you can see them in front of you in the pews. You can do one online as well. You can fill it out, submit it, or take it to one of our Connect centers. We'll give you a gift, or you can also put it in the offering plate just a little bit as well. But there's something about a personal touch. There's something about a personal word. And so today as we greet each other and welcome each other on Palm Sunday, if there's a person in this room that you just need to grab by the hand or hug somebody in an appropriate way or just to say, you mean the world to me, I hope you'll take the opportunity over the next few minutes to be able to do that. So let's welcome each other to First Baptist Church on this Palm Sunday. church family is greeting each other, we just want to take another opportunity to say thank you for joining us online. For those that live in or near Clarksville, we'd love to invite you to worship with us in person on Sundays. We have connect groups for all ages that begin at 9 a.m. and worship at 10.30 a.m. If you don't know where to go or what to do, we've made it super easy for you. Just check out the link below and plan your visit today. We hope to see you soon. Thank you for greeting one another. You may be seated this morning for a moment. Uh, gave you a little more time to do that because from what I'm hearing here, it's such a refreshing thing to hear you welcoming one another, encouraging one another, loving one another. And I pray somebody touched your heart and life today during our welcome time, fellowship time. Also, I want to encourage you starting tomorrow night in this very room is our week of prayer and fasting. Tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, 6 p.m. here. And then Friday's our Good Friday service. And then we'll be together on Saturday morning at 10. And then we'll finish up on Sunday morning at 8.15 in this room as well. All those can be accessed on our website. You can see those. But it's going to be a great week, and we encourage you to be a part of that. On Thursday night, Cole McCartney and our student ministry is going to be leading us. Hope you'll be here every night that night as we... Uh, look at the now generation, you might say, not simply the next generation, the now generation, as they lead us on Thursday evening. Also, want to encourage you to continue to be faithful with your Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Our goal is $25,000. We're going to surpass that. Thank you for giving so that we can get the gospel to people in North America with church planting and replanting and revitalization. Thank you for being faithful there. And then also, it's our desire not only to reach the nations and to reach North America, but it's our desire to reach our city. And so coming up on Saturday, April the 27th, is what we're having, Serve Clarksville. It's about our city. We hope two or 300 of us will come together on that Saturday and do ministry projects all over our community. And you can be a part of that. All ages can participate. The day when the service is over, you can go to the mission landing and you'll be able to see more information. You can sign up. And uh, you can even register there as well. You can go on the website and do the same thing. But we hope you'll be involved in that. So go to the missions landing today or look online and you'll see what Serve Clarksville is about, how you can participate. And we want to, again, cover our city as we seek to worship the Lord and love people, share Jesus, and make disciples. Well, I want to encourage you to stand with me for a moment again, and we're going to sing in just a moment the Spirit of the Living God. And I believe the Spirit of the Living God is at work among us today. And we want to make sure we follow his leadership. But today we're talking about Jesus said, I am the light of the world. What an amazing statement. Just one verse today, but John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. Here's what the Bible says. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He said he's the light of the world. Then he says, whoever follows me. Question is, I look around and see kids and students and adults. Are you and I following him? And I pray that we are. Today we're going to give tithes and offerings, and 
We're going to pray together and we're going to sing Spirit of the Living God as we continue to worship. Wednesday night, I was walking over to, to dinner. We have amazing Wednesday night ministries here. And a little eight-year-old hollered for me and said, hey, pastor, and I turned around and saw him. And he said, did you see my tithe that I gave last week? And I said, well, actually, I'm sorry I did not. But I said, I don't, I don't look at what people give, but thank you for doing that. And he had made $49 that week somehow, and he gave a little over a tithe for that. It's an eight-year-old. And I just said, what a great example your parents are setting before you. What a great lesson they're teaching you. But thank you for obeying the Lord, even in tithes and offerings at eight years old. And if he can do that, we can do that. And I pray that we will be generous today as we give. But we're going to pray together, and then we'll give tithes and offerings, and we'll sing together, and then we're going to share God's word when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, your spirit is at work among us. Thank you for the baptism service we saw just a moment ago. And Lord, that's priceless for me, to be able to see a daughter and her mom and dad Coming into the baptismal waters, not always easy to do that, but being obedient to you and thank you that we're able to witness that today. And Lord, I pray today for decisions to be made in this place, salvation, baptism, church membership, Christian life, Christian ministry. Lord, I pray for others who witness that today to say, I need to do the very same thing and that we will see obedience in this place because your spirit is at work. Thank you for what you're doing across North America. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do this week through our week of prayer and fasting. And thank you, Lord, that we get to serve you all over our community and city, that we make Jesus known to people because he is the light of the world and we need to share him in the midst of darkness. So, Lord, bless our tithes and offerings. I pray blessings on every ministry that we have in our church. And thank you on this Palm Sunday as you came into Jerusalem to praise and adoration. You came, Lord, to give your life as a ransom, as a sacrifice for us. And thank you for dying in our place. Thank you for your burial in a tomb. But, Lord, we're going to celebrate next week Easter. But today we're celebrating the tomb is empty as well. Thank you for being alive today. And because you're alive, you've sent your Holy Spirit. And because the Holy Spirit is among us, he is at work. And so thank you, Lord Jesus, that we give, we sing, we pray, and we adore you. And we pray these things today in Jesus' precious, sweet name. And all of God's people said, amen. Let's sing together, Spirit of the Living God.
John's Gospel, chapter 8, I am the light of the world. As you and I know, music is extremely powerful. Solid night or holy night, when we come to Christmas Eve services and we sing that hymn, that Christmas carol, we're generally lighting candles. There's something about solid night and light that go together. One of my favorite Christmas carols is Oh Holy Night. You know the song very, very well. It just says the stars are brightly shining. Even that song is connected to light. 
And then you like the little children's song that says, This Old Light of Mine. How many of you can sing that real quick? Anybody want to volunteer? But I remember growing up, This Old Light of Mine, I'm not going to let Satan it out. So that's all about light as well. And then we come to that great song by Hank Williams, I Saw the Light. How many of you like that one? Anybody here in the room like that? I Saw the Light. Uh, but light, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Uh, some months ago, Ange and I were hiking in Rotary Park late one Sunday afternoon. We were hiking the trails, we didn't even know where we were on the trails. But we knew this, light was our friend and darkness was our enemy. And so we, we hoped we were going to get back to the car, find our way before darkness came. And so the Lord was faithful and we got back to the car just in time before darkness came to figure out where we were at. But when you think about light, maybe you've been to Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, and you've walked deep into the cave, and you know the experience. You get deep into the cave, and all of a sudden they do what? They turn the lights out. And it's so dark in there, you can put your hand in front of your face, and you can't even see your hand. There's something terrifying about darkness, but there's something comforting about light. I was having lunch the other day with somebody again. We were in a restaurant. We were sitting there having good conversation, enjoying food, and all of a sudden the lights go out. And in our world, you're a little bit suspicious of that. You think, did they pay the bill? Well, we probably know they paid the bill. Something go wrong or somebody up to no good? And thankfully it wasn't long. The lights came back on again, but there's something about uh, light that brings us comfort in life. Now, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The Pharisees, and, and we see in John chapter 7, John chapter 8, and John chapter 9, the Pharisees were religious leaders. They were the churchgoers of the day. But the Pharisees, as we understand from God's word, could not stand Jesus. They, they did not like him. In fact, they wanted to kill him. And why did they want to kill him? They wanted to kill him because one reason was his I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Next week we'll see I am the resurrection and the life. When he made those I am statements, you can connect them back to the book of Genesis and you realize what? He is claiming to be God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And so they did not like Jesus and they wanted to kill him. But here's what we know when it comes to light. Light is about life. Darkness is about death in many ways. When you look at God's word, we see light is about heaven. Darkness is about hell, about torment. And when we see God's word and we see throughout the gospel of John and even other places in the Bible, we see there are two eternal destinies of people. Potentially, you could be in light, which is heaven, or darkness, which is torment, separation from him. And here's what we know. Every person in this room Every person you meet in the carpool line, every person you meet in the grocery store, every person you see in your neighborhood, we are going to be in one of those two places, in heaven or in hell. Here's what, though, is so confusing for people. When you think about your relationship to Christ, him being the light of the world, him being the bread of life, when you think about who he is, you think about people who do not know him, and they hear us talk about the Lord Jesus. Here's what confusing is confusing for them. For example, they say, based on what we say, you know Jesus as your Savior. Well, yes, I know Jesus as my Savior, but why don't you ever say anything to me about him? And we often say then, yes, I know Jesus as my Savior, but also I know I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. I know when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Why don't we talk to people about him? And then they say, you, you make comments about your life. When you go through adversities and trials and storms in life, Jesus helps you. He is there for you. You can run to him when you experience those things. Well, if that is the case, why aren't you talking to me about him? Because they look at their lives and say, I want to know him. I want him to change my life. I want to know I'm going to heaven when this life is over. And I go through trials, adversities, and storms like everybody else. I want him to help me as well. Why don't you say something to me about him if he means that much to you? And so I just want to challenge you and me as we think about people out there who do not have a relationship to Christ. And we talk about how much Jesus has changed our lives. We know we're going to go to heaven and he helps us when we face all sorts of things in life. Let's be willing to talk to other people about him because they're going through the same things and they can know him as well. 
And so I just encourage you, when you look at your family, when you think about your school, you think about your workplace, you think about your neighborhood, whom do you need to be having gospel conversations with? And talking to you to say, he is the bread of light, but he's also the light of the world. In the midst of darkness, you can live in light because he is the light of the world. And so how do you do that? Maybe again, you say, I need to have a conversation with a parent or with a child or with a grandparent or with a sibling in some way. Who needs to hear from you about your testimony of knowing Christ and walking with him? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Now, I want to invite you to look back just for a moment to the book of Genesis from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1. As we look at God's word, we see in the beginning of creation, Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so here's something again. Before there was light, we're going to see, here's what was happening on the earth. It was formless, it was void, and it was dark. One of the things I want us to realize, what is life like before we come to Christ? We're going to see that in just a moment. But verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was an evening, and there was a morning the first day. And so here, I want you to write these words down just for a moment. Here's what life is like without Jesus, who is the light of the world. Here's what life is like. First is formless. There are many people probably watching. There are many people maybe in this room. When you look at your lives, it seems to be formless. What do I mean? It means you have no purpose. There's no direction in your life. And so when you look at your life before Christ, you don't know what your grand purpose is. You don't know what your direction is in life. And so I just encourage you, if you find yourself in that situation, you have no direction, no guidance, no purpose in life, surrender your life to Jesus and let him give you direction, purpose, and meaning to your life. Why? Because he is the light of the world. Second word is the word void. There are many people who are outside of Christ. Their lives are just void. What I mean by that is they're empty in life. They've got this vacuum in life, this hole that nothing can fill. They, do, they try everything in the world to get that completed and filled. Nothing seems to work for them, and they find themselves empty. And here's the, the, the biblical truth as well as we know. You can have all the toys of this world and still be empty in life. That hole can still be there. You know why? Because it can only be filled with the bread of life and the light of the world, and his name is Jesus. And I encourage you again, if you find yourself without direction or purpose, you find yourself empty in life, there's this void that nothing this world offers is filling, I encourage you, surrender your life to Jesus and let him change you from darkness to light and give you direction and purpose and show you again. Let him fill your life up with his presence and direction and joy. Third word is dark. That's what it says. They were formless, void, and dark. As we think about dark, what does it mean? Again, to be dark, it means that you're, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You're living in darkness. But here's the good news. Jesus came to this earth and took on human flesh. He lived a perfect, sinless life, and he died on an old rugged cross, was buried in a tomb, but raised from the dead on the third day, victorious over death in the grave. One day he's coming again. He did that. Why? That he would change the lives of people. No longer do you have to live in darkness. You can live in light. No longer do you have to be dead. You can be made alive in Christ with one another as believers in Christ. He came to save and transform and change the lives of people. And so when you look at that, what's life like before Christ? Well, it's formless, it's void, it's dark. But the good news is that can change. Why? Because he is the light of the world. When God sent light into the world, it changed everything in Genesis 1. When he sent the light of the world into the world, it changed everything as well. And his name is Jesus. And so as we look at that, here's what life is like outside of Christ. Now, as we go back to John chapter 8, I want you to walk through this. I want you to write these few things down as well. When we look at this text, John chapter 7, John chapter 8, and John chapter 9, I want you to think about these three principles about Jesus' revelation to us. Number one is the setting. I want you to understand the setting of where Jesus is talking about being the light of the world. What is the setting? In John chapter 7, it's about the festival of tabernacles. Say, so what in the world does that mean? There's another name for it, as you see in the Bible. It's called the Feast of Booths. 
It was a celebration, about a week-long celebration. It was everything about light. And so what does that mean is, it was everything about light. They were celebrating light. They were celebrating Jesus being the light of the world. The setting is, again, that he would give direction and light to your path and what he wants you to do in life. So that is the setting. It's this festival that's taking place, a week-long celebration. The focus, there were lights everywhere. And then Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. Number two is the statement. The statement is this, I am the light of the world. Not that I could be or I might be or I was. I am the light of the world. That is his statement. And what Jesus is doing, what we discovered last week, when he said, I am the bread of life, what he's doing this week when he says, I am the light of the world, he is revealing himself to you and me. He is showing us this is who I am. Now, if somebody asks you on this Palm Sunday, Somebody asks you this week in Holy Week, who is Jesus? What would you be able to say? Who is he? That's one thing again. These seven I am statements based on his seven miracles, he's revealing himself. He's saying, this is who I am. You and I need to be able to say to other people, this is who he is. When Jason and I were in Colorado a couple of months ago, we were having lunch again at this restaurant and we met this young lady who was serving us there. And she had a very pleasant personality, and we, we had a gospel conversation with her, and the focus of that conversation was on simply this, who is Jesus? And God used us in that conversation in that restaurant to sow gospel seeds about who Jesus is. And I was on a Zoom call with a pastor we were having lunch with in Colorado this past week, and I asked him, had he met this young lady since we were there? And he said he had, not in the restaurant, but out in the town. And he said she had a smile on her face that doesn't know she came to Christ, but those gospel seeds were bearing fruit in her life. Why? Because we talked to her about who Jesus is. And so we see the setting is about this festival that's taking place. The statement is Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then number three is the source. He says, I am the light of the world. But here's the interesting part. When you go back to Matthew's gospel, chapter five, Jesus turns the table for you and me. No question, he is the light of the world. But in Matthew chapter five, beginning in verse 14, he turns the table and he says this, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so here's the source. You and I can be light in the midst of darkness. Why? Because we are connected to the source and his name is Jesus because he is the light of the world. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to be a little Christ. So if he is the light of the world, he's called us to be light of the world as well. As you put your light out there. Don't, don't put it under a basket. Let it shine to others that you're around. So let me ask you, when you think about your family, when you think about your workplace, you think about your school, you think about your neighborhood, you think about other places you're at during the week, are you letting your light shine before others? Again, not so that we'll get the big head and get the ego. No, so that the Heavenly Father will be glorified. Are you the light of the world? As Jesus said, he is the light. And here's what I can promise you. The closer you live to the light of the world, that is Jesus, the brighter you're going to shine in your circles of influence. So if you want to shine bright in your family, you want to shine bright in your neighborhood. You want to shine bright in your, in your schools. You want to shine bright in your workplaces. You want to shine bright wherever God allows your paths to go. If you want to do that, the closer you live in the intimacy with the light of the world, his name is Jesus, the brighter you're going to shine and the more glory he's going to get. And so I encourage you as you think about the setting, it's this festival, it was about light, the statement, I am the light of the world, the source, the way you can be the light of the world is that you're connected to the light of the world who is Jesus and let him work in and through your life to bring glory to the heavenly father and you can shine in the midst of darkness. That's his desire for every single one of us who are believers in Christ. He is the light of the world. Now, over the next number of minutes, I want us to think about what difference does Jesus' revelation make to you and me? And so I want to give you these five statements as we walk through this text in John chapter 8. What difference does this make when he says, last week, I'm the bread of life. He's satisfied, but what difference does it make when he says here, 
that I am the light of the world. Number one, we embrace a biblical worldview. I hope in your life, when I look at kids or I look at students or I look at adults, I hope that you see life through the eyes of Jesus. I hope you see life through the eyes of faith. I hope you see life through the eyes of truth, gospel, biblical truth. I was thinking about even this morning, and I just made myself a note, when I, when I think about God's word in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, this incredible, incredible chapter, what does he say there when you think about light? He says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Aren't you grateful that God's word helps us know which way to go in life? That's the word of God for you and me. It's light for us, not, not darkness, but light. And so I hope you have this biblical worldview that when you look at your life again, you're seeing life, you're seeing circumstances, you're seeing decisions through the eyes of Jesus, through the eyes of what it means to live by faith and not by sight, but also through biblical truth. Now here's what we know. Light, as we're going to see in John chapter 8, light is about freedom. Darkness is about bondage. And Jesus makes a statement in this passage when he says, again, you shall know the truth, and the truth will do what? Will set you free. He's the light of the world. He is the truth. And he says, if you know me and trust me and follow me, you can live with spiritual freedom. Again, you shall know the truth. The truth will set you free. Verse 36, those whom the Son sets free are free indeed. So light is about freedom. Darkness is about bondage. Light exposes what's in the dark. Numbers chapter 32, you know this verse very well. Your parents probably quoted it to you when you were growing up. You can be sure of this. Your sins will find you out. What's done in darkness can become light. Here's what I know. Uh, you, you, can, you can fool your parents. You can fool your husband and wife. You can even fool me as your pastor about what you do behind closed doors in darkness. But I promise you this, you will not fool the light of the world. He knows everything you and I do. And so that's a way to live life. It's a way to think about life, to realize, listen, I may deceive others. I may get away with that from other people, but you're not going to get away from that, the light of the world because he knows everything. Now, in John chapter 8, we see this story. It's a story about this lady who was caught in the very act of adultery. It says in John chapter 8, verse 1, it says that he went on his, he went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And so we've been there in many times. What an incredible place to overlook the city of Jerusalem. And it says early in the morning, he came again to the temple and the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Jesus sometimes would teach standing up, but sometimes he would teach sitting down. In this context, he was sitting down, and then as he was there, they brought this woman to him who had been caught in the very act of adultery. Interesting in John chapter, we don't have any clue what happened to the man. He's never mentioned really in that story. It's about her. Now, as you think about the law and here being caught in the act of adultery, what, was, what could have been the consequences? Well, it could have been death for her. Based on the law, she could have been stoned to death. And so Jesus is having this conversation, and it goes on to say about this lady, so what, what do you say? And they been in, bring this charge against, against him. So Jesus, it says, bent down. He got up, and he bent down, and he wrote with his finger on the ground, and they continued to ask him. He stood up and said to them, and here's kind of the mic drop moment for Jesus in this crowd who wants this woman to be killed, stoned to death, caught in the act of adultery. And then Jesus writing on the ground. People say, what did he write? Many of us, we don't know. He could have been writing the sins of the people who were around him. But he's writing with his finger on the ground. He stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they all started going away. And then Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. When you look at this, embrace this biblical worldview. Here's what I mean by that. Here's a challenge I want to give to you today. When you think about what Jesus is being the light of the world, he knows everything. Everything behind closed doors. You don't do anything that escapes him. When you come to life with this biblical worldview, you see life through Jesus, you see life through faith, you see life through biblical truth. It changes your life because here's what happens. You start making decisions realizing that Jesus knows everything. 
It changes your behaviors. It changes your decisions. It changes your priorities when you live life with a biblical worldview, knowing this, that he is the bread of life, but also knowing that what he is, the light of the world. Let me give you number two. We serve in a strategic time. It wouldn't take me much to convince you that you and I live in a dark time and even, even city and life. We, we live in the midst of darkness. But it's a very strategic time. If you turn on television, you watch very much, here's what you're going to see. They're going to glamorize sexual immorality and disobedience to God. You take God's word, absolute truth, here's what he says about life, here's what he says about marriage, here's what he says about family, here's what he says about purity, and you're going to see television programs, they're going to glamorize sexual immorality and disobedience to God. It is everywhere on television. You also know this, that we're living in a day and time where violence seems to be growing in our city. You just read the news, you read the headlines, we see violent acts all throughout our city. We see people in our city who are dealing with anger issues in life. I mean, they're just angry. They're, they're not kind. They're not compassionate. They're angry at other people in life. You meet them in stores. You see them in restaurants. You face them on the road everywhere. We're just around angry, upset people. And then road rage is a major issue that's growing in cities, even cities like we live in. You just watch the news and you see somewhere on an interstate, someone shot into a car. I saw on the national news the other day, someone shot into a trunk and hit the guy somewhere driving down the road. Just a road rage situation. And, and I think this is hilarious. It's sad, but it's hilarious. Two times last week, I was on Madison Street going home, minding my own business and tried to help two different people to, to move from one lane to another lane or to do something else. I had two people on Madison Street last week who literally gave me the finger and said I was number one in life. And I tried to help them. <laughs> and I'm walking away kind of dumbfounded. That's what I told Angie. I said, what in the world is up with these people? I'm trying to help them. I let the guy turn in front of me. I tried to get the other guy into the other lane. And they both told me I was number one. Why? I'm trying to help you. I, I didn't do anything back because I thought, mercy, they may shoot a gun next. I don't know. Just minding my own business trying to help people. But we're living in a day where anger is everywhere, road rage is everywhere, violence is all around us. But we serve in a strategic time. And here's what I mean by that is don't you see that, but we've got spiritual lostness all around us. I mean, there are thousands upon thousands of people around us who are lost without a relationship to Christ. And let me ask you, do you know a single person who is lost today without Jesus? Can, can you put a name to that face? Is it a family member? Is it a neighbor? Is it somebody you work with? Somebody in your school? Somebody you've met in the community? Do you know somebody who is outside of a relationship to Jesus? And then here's the big question. Are you praying for that person by name for him or her to get saved? We live and we serve in a strategic time. Yes, there's darkness all around us, but Jesus is the light of the world and he's called us to be light of the world as well because when we're intimate with him, then we shine for him. So we live and serve in a strategic time. And I'm gonna make a statement. It's not a political statement. It's a gospel statement. It's a biblical statement. And here's the statement. I don't care who the next president of the United States is going to be, but he is not going to change the world. There is one person who would change the world, and he is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is Jesus Christ. We're involved in politics. We do all those things because we're citizens of this country. But again, our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ who is the light of the world. Why? Because we live and serve in a strategic time. Number three, we possess a global mission. When I think about the statement right there, Jesus says, what, I am the light of the what? World. We, we possess a global mission. Do you realize our church, First Baptist Church here in Clarksville, Tennessee, we are not a country club. Oh, there are country clubs. Many of us are members of country clubs. They're for members only, but the church is not a country club for members only. We are a hospital for those who need help in life, spiritual help. 
Praise the Lord that we come and we reach out to people who are sinful, in darkness, dead in their sins, and we see the grace of God, the spirit of the, of the living God at work among us. And what does he do? He saves people. He changes people. And we possess a global, global mission. And when I think about that mission, I think about, Lord, you want us to reach our city. You have called us to reach our state. You want us to reach our nation. You want us to reach nations around the world. We have a global mission. Why? Because he is the light of the world. There's darkness all over the world, and he is the light, and he wants us to be the light. And so we're to go share Jesus with people in our city, state, nation, and around the world. One of the things I got excited about and I appreciate very much, and some of them are here this morning, and as we think about people who are going, there was a thing in Panama City just a few weeks ago that we had some individuals from our church, young, young ladies involved in that from Baptist Campus Ministry here at Austin P, but also in our church, called Beach Reach. And I'm so excited about this now generation to say, listen, he is the light of the world and I want to be light as well. And he wants to use me to reach other people who need Jesus in life. And I'm thankful when spring break happened, the first week of March, they gave up their spring break week, their time to go to Panama City Beach, Florida, not on a vacation, but on a mission trip, and to say, I want to share the light of the world with people in Panama City Beach, coming from all over the nations to be there, and I want to be his witness. I want to be light in the midst of darkness. And how did God use those young people? Panama City, working with, with lost, drunk college students. What happened in the midst of that? Here's what happened. The Holy Spirit of God was at work. And he used those individuals, Beach Reach, Panama City, people from our church, people, other young people there. They're, here they are in Panama City, ministering to people who are drunk and lost. And then they share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. He's the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the only way to be saved. They heard the gospel. And many of those drunk, lost college students got saved, born again, redeemed, new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord for young people who are willing to give up their time, give up their week. It's not about themselves. They're willing to go to Panama City Beach, serve in a very tough environment in the midst of darkness, but they made a gospel kingdom difference. Why? Because he is the light of the world and he's using them as his light also. People got saved. Lives got changed. Why? Because young people are willing to be on mission to say, we possess a global mission and we need to reach this generation for the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord for that. So I just want to ask you, when you look at your life, you look at your circle of influence, how is the Lord using you? He's calling us. He's calling every single one of us here believers that we would reach our city, our state, our nation, and the nations with the gospel because he is the light of the world. Number four, we proclaim a risen Savior. Church, I'm thankful today and when Sunday's come and Wednesday's come and other times of the church when we come together, I am thankful that we don't preach and teach Reader's Digest. I am thankful that we don't preach and teach self-help books. But what do we do? We have come together in the name of Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit. We open God's word from Genesis to Revelation and what do we preach and teach? We preach the living word of God. This book will never return void. This is inspired of God, breathed from him. We teach and preach the whole counsel of God. Right. Now, what does this book say? Here's what this book says. This book says that Jesus Christ is the hero of this Bible. When you look at Genesis and you look all the way through Revelation, it is pointing people to the bread of life and to the light of the world, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it say about his life? It says that the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was willing to leave heaven and be born in a stable in Bethlehem and take on human flesh. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died a horrific, sacrificial death on a cross at the old rugged cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb only for a few days. He didn't need it long. Long. It was a short amount of time. And then on Resurrection Sunday, the stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. Jesus Christ was alive then. He's alive today. He's coming again one day. He is the light of the world. And what do we do on this Palm Sunday? We preach, proclaim a risen Savior. He is alive. 
He says, what I am, the light of the world. He, that's present tense. He's not dead. He's not in a grave in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ is alive. He is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. Next week, he's going to be the resurrection and the life. He is coming again, but we proclaim, we preach, we testify about a risen Savior. And then number five, we believe a hallelujah promise. And what's that promise? Well, I'm going to tell you. If you're saved and you're born again and you know Christ, just say amen. amen. Let me do that again. Some of you will get it this time. If you're saved and you're born again and you know Christ, say amen together. Amen. amen. Hey, that's more like it right there. That's good. When the spirit of the living God is at work, that's how it should be right there. Well, I want to make a hallelujah promise to you. If, you, if you're saved, you're born again, you know Christ, you've been redeemed, here's the good news. You will never be lost again. Never. You are secure in Christ. He's the bread of life. He's the light of the world. He's the resurrection and the life. You will never be lost again. That is a hallelujah promise. No matter what the devil throws at you, no matter how he tries to mess up your life, you are on a foundation. You are on the solid rock, and the solid rock can never be shaken. Why? Because Jesus is victorious, and the devil loses. I saw on television the other day that it was this, this home repair company, and they said at the end of their commercial, a healthy foundation is a healthy home. And I'm, that's, a, that's a great word. I, mean, if you, if, I encourage couples when I do premarital counseling to say, hey, and, and when you get ready to buy a house, you want to focus on all the, the walls and the lights and the countertops and everything else, but focus on the foundation because the foundation's bad, the house is going to be bad. But if you're going to have a great marriage, you focus on the foundation. But here's the good news. According to Matthew chapter 7, our foundation is who? It's Jesus. He's the solid rock. And so when you build your life on the solid rock, not on sand, but on a solid rock, I don't care what the devil tries to do to you. You are victorious in Christ. Why? Because he lived a perfect life, died a death, resurrected on the third day. But here's the good news. He has defeated death. He has defeated the grave. Jesus Christ is victorious. We have victory in Jesus. And so we believe a hallelujah promise. So I, the, the, the home repair company said a healthy foundation is a healthy house, healthy home. But I say this, a healthy foundation is a healthy life. If you're going to live a healthy life, make sure your life is built on the rock who is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the light of the world. Ains and I, a number of years ago, we were, we were tent camping. That's an amazing thought to think about. We were tent camping out in Yosemite National Park. And so we're out there tent camping, and I get up early in the morning, and it's, it's, it's kind of the middle of the night. And I go outside the tent and I look up in the, in the sky and there weren't a lot of lights around. But I looked up in the sky and I literally saw what I would think would have been millions of stars. I, mean, I could see the light from those stars. And I stood there and Angie got up and she came out there as well. We stood out there in front of that tent in Yosemite National Park and we were, we were praising the Lord. And we're praising the Lord. Why? Because of his glory and his grace. And we're praising the Lord, looking up in the stars. And I just remembered Psalm 147, verse 4. He determines the number of the stars. And I thought, Lord, there's not a star up there that's an accident to you. I mean, you determine the number of those stars up there. But here's where it gets really exciting, too. He gives to all of them their names. When we stood up that side that tent in Yosemite and that's where we looked up and we saw all those stars. Lord, you put every single one of them up there because you are the light of the world, but also, Lord, you know every single one of those stars by name. I want you to lean in and understand this. When I think about those stars and he knows every single one of them by name, I think about your life. According to Psalm 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He knows your name. He knows you better than you know yourself. But here's what I want you to see. Just as he put those stars in place, just as he has given you life today and he knows you, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, he wants you to live in light, not in darkness. And so I want to ask you, he's the bread of life, but he said, I'm the light of the world. Are you living in light, spiritual light, or spiritual darkness? I want to encourage you today.
Palm Sunday, if you're in this place or you're watching somewhere around the world and you're living in darkness, meaning you don't know Christ, if you died today, you would not spend eternity in heaven. You'd spend eternity in torment. I want to encourage you. I plead with you. I appeal to you. Today, surrender your life, turn from your sin, embrace the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. He is the light of the world. He will take you from darkness to light. He will take you from being dead to make you alive with him. Give your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him save you today. Experience his grace. Be born again. Be forgiven and experience new life in Jesus. And if we can help you make that decision, we're going to give an invitation. We welcome you to come forward, and you can make that decision even right here this morning. You've witnessed baptism in a glorious way today. If you're here and you've never followed Jesus in biblical baptism, obedience to him, we encourage you to come forward and make that decision as well. You need to join the fellowship of this church. What a glorious Sunday to obey the leadership of Christ. You, you, you need to surrender to Christian ministry. He's calling you vocationally that God would use you and you would serve him. I pray you will be obedient to him also. And then if there's any other issues in the Christian life, invitations are meant for you to come to Jesus and to say, I want to give my heart, I want to give my life, I want to give everything to Jesus. Why? Because he is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the one who will change my life. And so I want us to bow together as we pray together today. And again, in this room, but those who are watching literally around the world, if there's a decision you need to make, we encourage you to let us know on whatever platform you're watching on. And in this room, our pastoral team is going to be here. Our prayer team is going to be here. We encourage you to come forward so that we can celebrate with you and help you from God's word to be faithful, to be obedient, and to let Jesus change your life because he is the light of the world. Now, Lord Jesus, there's a lot that we just covered. And, Lord, we're not trying to force or manipulate anyone to make a decision. But, Lord Jesus, as your Holy Spirit is at work, I pray today that people will come forward in this invitation in obedience to you. They'll draw near to you because you are the light of the world. And, Father, as they obey you, you will use them and their witness and their obedience to other people. And thank you for asking us to be the light of the world as well. And so, Lord, as we live close to you, we'll shine brighter to those around us. So thank you, Lord, for being the light of the world. Now, Lord, in this invitation, we can just simply say, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. And any decisions that are made, Lord, is for your glory and for your honor. But we want to help people walk and know Jesus in life. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
beautiful day to worship. Jesus is the light of the world, so the challenge is to let his light shine through us. And just because the service is over does not mean the invitation to respond is. If you have any questions about anything, please email us. Someone on our staff will respond to you. Well, we want to say thank you again for watching online this week. Share today's service with someone you love. And speaking of love, we love you, church. And we'll see you next week.